uh, what I'm going to do here really is just is, is give you a bit of a, a summing up of uh, 11 trips that I had done over about an 18 month period and uh, to kind of get uh, a handle on this, this, this climate change issue and how it's impacting the Arctic. And I don't think I'm going to tell you anything that you probably don't know already because the uh, World Wildlife Fund is doing tremendous work and in fact actually probably leading uh, the way to a lot of the revelations that are taking place. So, so for, forgive me if, if this sounds a bit facile, um, but what I really wanted to do was try to um, approach this from a public policy angle because I think it's one of the greatest public policy challenges of our time. Um, but in a way that uh, the general public c could understand and not feel that, you know, this is more of a, you know, the, uh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling kind of thing and, you know, giving up. Um, so I tried to make it a little bit fun. I'm trying to make this a little bit fun. Uh, and w the way I started it off and, and was, was to define what is the Arctic? I mean, it's, a, it's an important question because there are many different, different definitions. You can look at it, it's everything north of the Arctic Circle, but that really doesn't count because most people think of everything north of 60 as the Arctic, and it's really the subarctic. So if you use that definition, okay, what about those people who live around northern Manitoba and northern Ontario that live in a, an environment that's more Arctic than it is subarctic? You know, you've got huge polar bear populations in that part of the world. So it's not easily defined. Um, let me just take you through how, how difficult it is to try to define it is you've got the St. Elias Mountains in the southwest corner of the Yukon and Alaska which is the biggest so subpolar ice field in uh, the northern hemisphere. Uh, you've got glaciers which uh, cover most of the high arctic islands uh, that represent huge amounts of fresh water that, that are locked up uh, in this ice and you've got what I think is most people forget is a lot of sea ice which to the Inuit is really an extension of land. I mean if you go to many of these Inuit communities they don't differentiate between land and ice because um, this is their highways to go hunting, this is the easiest way to get to one community from another and so they re regard it as, as, as land as, as, as important as, as land is. Um, the Arctic is also pollinias, which are open bodies uh, of water surrounded by ice uh, and they, they form, they remain open predictably in certain places of the Arctic and they're extremely important as biological hotspots because um, if you think about it, this is where a lot of marine mammals have to go in the winter time uh, because they got to breathe and these areas tend to be very productive and this is where a lot of polar bears go, a lot of walrus go, a lot of seals go. Um, the Arctic is also extremely lush habitats such as uh, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska and Ivivik National Park in Canada. Um, it's spectacular scenery. It's also, you know, places that attract a lot of tourists, a lot of climbers. This is the Cirque of the Unclimbables. Uh, Climbing Magazine rates it as one of the top 50 climbs in the world. Uh, it's an extremely difficult place to get to but uh, mesmerizing. Um, the Arctic is also strange, weird phenomena that we don't fully understand. Uh, these are the smoking hills on the Arctic coast. They've been on fire for the last 10,000 years. And really, the, the sulfur emissions that come from this have created a, an extremely um, acidified environment where very few things grow, but some things grow, and things have evolved, plants have evolved in a very unique way. Um, it's also deltas. Uh, the Mackenzie Delta, which is one of the tenth largest delta in the world, uh, at the north end of uh, the mainland of the Northwest Territories, and it's also the Peace Athabasca Delta in the southern end of the subarctic. Uh, both of them extremely important flyways and nesting spots for migratory birds, uh, important hunting areas for the Dene at the south end and the Inuvialuit at the north end. And the Arctic is also the geography of the imagination. Uh, it is places like Ukuk, Siksalik, uh, Wager Bay, which is at the north end of Hudson Bay. Uh, no one lives there. It's, an, it's, it's, it's really one of the most wonderful places in, 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 in the Arctic. The Inuit call it their Garden of Eden. Uh, and it's really what our, inspires our poets, um, our writers. It's the, it's, it's the place that mesmerizes uh, a, a lot of people and inspires us. Um, 
and perhaps most importantly, the Arctic is a lot of fresh water flowing north. Um, and water that still, in most cases, you can simply, if you're going to be a paddler, go down and you can dip your cup in the water and you can drink it without fear that you're, you know, going to be rushing off to the tundra to find a place to, you know what, after. Uh, this is the Mackenzie River, one of the, you know, largest rivers in North America. Um, the Nahani River, this happens to be uh, uh, Jerry here, uh, navigating his way through Pulpit Rock. The Firth River, which flows out of Alaska into the Yukon and into the Beaufort Sea. We've lost a few, but um, you have to think of those as in, in, in a way that this fresh water is not only pure water flowing north, but it's also warm fresh water that's flowing into the Arctic Ocean and it influences the circulation of currents, uh, the formation of ice, and so you have more of it, you have less of it. This has a profound influence of, what, of, what, of what's happening up there. And it also flushes a lot of toxins into that environment. So now we're finding that the, the mercury that uh, is washing out of, produced by all of the forest fires in the uh, subarctic regions are now finding their way into these rivers flowing north and showing up in beluga whales. Uh, the Arctic is uh, indigenous wildlife species such as doll sheep, barren ground caribou, uh, musk oxen, Arctic fox, Arctic wolves, the barren ground grizzly, which is about two thir thirds the size of uh, the grizzlies you'd find in, in the Rockies, and of course the iconic polar bear. And then you also have those Arctic animals uh, that these predators eat, which the Arctic hare, the Arctic ground squirrel, the lemming, um, red-throated loon, snowy owl. These are the itinerants, I, sh I should point out. These are the birds that fly, fly north and are also an important part of the Ar Ar Arctic ecosystem. And the sandhill crane and the whooping crane, the, which we know just this uh, past winter in Texas had probably their worst year ever. Uh, uh, nearly a third of the population died. And so we're left with a very weak population that's flying north this year that's probably not going to produce any uh, young as a result of the tough time that they had as a result of dro droughts in uh, the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge. And I guess finally and absolutely most important, the Arctic is about people. For, from a public policy perspective, I think this is something that's often overlooked, is that all of those animals, those rivers, uh, that landscape, it means something to those people who live in the Arctic. And I think that um, we tend to overlook that when we make decisions uh, from Ottawa about what happens in the north. And you have the Dene in uh, the western Arctic and the Gwich'in as well and the Inuit of the eastern and ce central Arctic. Okay, and I've wanted to also point out the new Vialuit of the, of the Western Arctic. Um, the other, uh, the, the, the point I want to make right now is that the, our history of, 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 of the Arctic, our view of the Arctic has always been a flawed one. Uh, right from the time of uh, Pythias and, and the Greek, early Greek sailors had a vision that beyond the riparian mountains in Northern Europe, there was this land that was ice free, where the sun shone for 24 hours a day, which a place that was disease free, where uh, lutes played and maidens danced, and it was a paradise. And the Greeks uh, believed that, you know, if they would be able to get beyond those mountains, that they would find this, uh, this paradise. And Pythias got probably as far as Iceland, maybe Greenland, we don't know for sure. Uh, but it influenced few uh, explorers that followed. Um, one of the early maps uh, of the Arctic uh, done by the, the great map maker Mercator actually had an open polar sea uh, beyond at the North Pole that had four islands that were inhabited by pygmies. And that map, believe it or not, we find it observed, that map was uh, used by uh, explorers for 400, 500 years. 
and they believed that there was an open polar sea that would actually get them over the pole to the other side of the world. And then it uh, was refined to think that they could get themselves through the Northwest Passage. And there were a number of different theories for this. One was that the saltier the water got, the less likely it was going to melt. And because you had 24 hours of sunlight, that in the summertime you would have all that ice melting. And so the early scientists really did try to uh, uh, make what Pythias had said and what the Greeks had said. They tried to, to, to prove that it actually existed and why it existed. Uh, and we know the end result of that was that the, uh, the, the North Pole was covered in ice and that uh, for 500 years uh, the search for an open polar sea and the Northwest Passage was a failed one. We lost 85 ships during that time and hundreds of sailors. It was a, uh, a hu it was a disaster. Um, and so we went back to this idea that, you know, really that the Arctic was a remnant of snowball Earth 670 million years ago when the Earth was basically totally frozen and covered in ice, except for maybe a few little refugia here. And then along came uh, a pilot in 1985 by the name of Paul Tudge, and he's flying over the north end of Axel Heiberg Island at the, at the one of the most northerly islands of Canada, and he sees what he thinks are tree trunks, trunks sticking out of the ground. And he reports this back to scientists, and scientists are a bit skeptical. They think, okay, we know that a lot of driftwood from Siberia in the Western Arctic, you know, finds its way uh, into the Arctic Ocean, and currents move it around, and maybe this is what he saw. And he said, no, 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 I saw tree trunks sticking out of the ground. So they sent a scientist up the next year, and lo and behold, there were tree trunks sticking out of the ground, uh, and uh, at the, right at the end of an ice field. And uh, not only were these, you know, uh, they were, the tree trunks in some cases were 18 feet long, six feet in diameter, and they were so perfectly preserved that they could see, you know, they had uh, the spruce cones, they had nuts and seeds, and they even had the amber um, from those trees. And the scientist, you know, realized that he had found the kind of the holy grail of paleobotany. Um, but he kept it under cover for the longest time because when word got out that, that he, what he had discovered, that some sci pseudoscientists had seen too many episodes of Jurassic Park, thought that if they could only get some of this amber, they could maybe extract, you know, the blood of a mosquito or the DNA of a mosquito and, and go on to their own science fiction experiment. And so he kept it quiet for the longest time. There were also creationists who believed that he had actually found Noah's Ark. Um, and so when they dated that fossil forest, they, they dated it to a time that was 45 million years ago. And of course, this puzzled them, you know, wondering, well, what was it about the Arctic 45 million years ago that could grow such big trees? And, you know, it led to a whole new avenue of science. And um, it's an interesting one because a number of other discoveries follow. This one uh, on Devon Island, it's the uh, Devon Island largely just to look at the breccia, the, the, the rock that, uh, that, that was a fallout from this. And uh, incidentally, they found the remains of uh, ancient rhinoceros and other animals that lived at that time, um, that more temperate animals. And they did a lot of dating and they found some, some fossil wood and found that, you know, 39 million years ago, it was warmer uh, in the Arctic that far north than it would say would have been in Winnipeg or Edmonton. I shouldn't use Winnipeg as an, an example. If anybody's here from Winnipeg would know what I mean. Um, and then there was a, a, a number of other, other discoveries. This one on, uh, on Ellesmere Island, Strathcona Fjord, where at this spot, I don't know if you can see those two men at the extreme left uh, are digging out a spot. They're from the Museum of Nature. Uh, what, they, what they found was a, an ancient beaver pond site, a dam, uh, which was a, a, a wonderful discovery because when the first scientists went in there and they brought this back home, they looked at it and Dick Harrington from, from the museum said, I know what that is. That's beaver chewing marks. That's the teeth of the beaver that did that. And he was really intrigued because he had been working on the Whitestone River in the northern Yukon at the time and he had unearthed the remains of uh, woolly mammoths and uh, scimitar cats and uh, uh, six-foot-tall beavers that existed 200,000 years ago in the northern Yukon. And he thought, wow, we've got six-foot-tall beavers possibly as far north as El Ellesmere Island. I better get up there. And, you know, this could be a circumpolar animal and that lived 4.5 million years ago. So he was fascinated and ended up doing this excavation. 
and uh, was a bit disappointed to find out that it wasn't a six foot tall beaver, it was actually a beaver that's about one third of the size of our modern beavers. So these are miniature beavers that existed 4.5 million years ago. But he also found the remains of uh, three-toed horses, uh, ancient badgers, uh, ancestral black bears, uh, and a variety of animals and fish uh, that uh, you know, we know nothing about, that are, are, are new to us. And what it all said was that 4.5 million years ago, again, it was as warm up in the Arctic as it was, say, in Edmonton, and in some cases even warmer. And uh, so they served as really interesting analogs about you know, the past, that it, it, it led to the understanding that the Arctic for the last 100,000 years was warm, a lot more warm and more lush and productive than it was in the last three and a half million years when suddenly things started to go into a kind of a tailspin and got cold and glaciers started forming and um, we went back and forth, the natural variations where it got hot and where it got cold, and new species arrived on the scene and old ones disappeared. And um, the question now is, we don't know what caused that. Uh, you know, there are theories that it was methane burps, that it could have been uh, ocean currents that pumped a lot of very warm water in the Arctic. Uh, there are an, any number of theories that haven't really been proven, but it, it, it remains fascinating because how do you get deciduous trees that grow in the Arctic uh, when it's dark for, totally dark for four months a year? How do those plants that are, uh, those animals, big animals, uh, survive in a dark environment? I mean, they can't migrate those long distances. It just seems very unlikely that they, go that, they could go that far south. So it's a great mystery. What's not a mystery now is that we're pumping a lot of heat into the atmosphere and greenhouse gases are trapping it. So we're in a kind of a new paradigm. We're kind of going backward in time, uh, but we're the ones that are driving this. And uh, there's, there's no doubt some natural variation that's taking place as well. But I think it's pretty well established that we're the main drivers for the heating that's, going, that's taking place. So the big question uh, you know, is what are we doing to the Arctic by, by doing that? Well, number one, you know, predictably, the glaciers are melting very, very quickly. Um, I apologize for this. This, is, uh, this, this, this isn't going, or we're missing a few things, but uh, this is the, the uh, Lowell Glacier in the southwest corner of the Yukon, the St. Elias Mountains that I talked about early on. Um, and this is one of the great glaciers that flow out of there. This is 70 kilometers long. It's about five, six kilometers uh, uh, wide. That was the photo, that line is where the, where the ice was in 1980 when I took that picture. And you can see that it's receded about five kilometers and it's lost about 20 meters of height. It's melting extremely rapidly and it's not the only one. 99% of the glaciers in the Arctic uh, are either stalled or they're receding. This is the last remaining uh, ice field in the Northwest Territory. It's just nor north of uh, Nahani National Park where you saw that picture of Jerry. Uh, this is where the Nahani gets a lot of its water. And it's about the size of the city of Ottawa. And if you can see those two scientists sta uh, standing in the foreground, that's where the toe of the glacier was 20 years ago. That's where it is now. And a lot of people will ask the question, well, I mean, OK, so there's not a lot of people living up there. What is this, you know, what's the importance of this? Well, number one, uh, it creates a problem for managers in Nahani National Park because now the river, the Nahani River, is in flood a lot longer in the season than it used to be. So it creates a bit of a hazard for, for adventurers. And, uh, you know, for, you say, okay, well, what, what do they care? They don't have to go. There's only 900 people that really need to use that river. But if you also think about it, um, these, this water flow is really important uh, for a number of other reasons. Um, reasons that you may not like, but people in the north are really interested in is uh, hydroelectric power. Uh, what does the melting of glaciers and, the, and, and the, the recession of the snowpacks mean for the, the river flows and how is it going to impact on their ability to generate power down the road? Uh, the other question that people are asking is that, you know, the Nahani flows into the Liard, which flows into the Mackenzie, as what does it mean for navigation along the Mackenzie River, which uh, is most of the food that comes north uh, is, comes along by barge. 
Um, and these barges now are starting to ground because uh, the water is disappearing very quickly. And once those glaciers disappear, once they're gone, we're going to see things dry up pretty quickly. So here in the Peace, Peace Athabasca Delta and the Mackenzie Delta that I talked about earlier, um, one scenario says that even, even if we didn't lose the glaciers, that the way the, the climate is heating up, that 15,000 of the 45,000 lakes in the Mackenzie Delta will disappear in about 15 years, 15 to 20 years. Uh, because we're not getting the flooding that occurs where the banks of the river overflows um, in the springtime and fills up all of those shallow lakes. So the less water you have, the less likely you're, you're going to have a flood. And 15,000 lakes is going to be catastrophic for a lot of migrating birds, a lot of delta animals, and for all those people who depend on that delta for their food and their, their living. And the other thing that's going to happen is, is that, that's extremely important is that we're going to have, we're having permafrost melting. Most of the Arctic is frozen. The ground is frozen. There's a lot of water into it. And that frozen water is like cement that's holding the soil together, soil and gravel together. And as things heat up, that soil is starting to fall apart. And in places like Banks Island, where this picture is taken, you can kind of see what happens is that the, in some areas on hillsides, they've collapsed. And we've seen mountainsides completely fall apart in the Arctic. And it doesn't really matter if no one lives there, but say, what if you were living in Tuktoyaktuk on the Arctic coast and a Klavik and uh, a number of uh, uh, Alaskan villages that are located on the coast, and the, many of these are no more than five meters above sea level. Once that permafrost starts to disintegrate, these uh, communities start slowly falling into the sea. And the other thing that's happening is without sea ice in the summertime, as we're seeing now, those big storms that wash those big, huge waves coming up on shore now are no longer buffered by that ice. They actually get to shore, whereas before they just broke up the ice. And when they get to shore and they're hitting that, that thawing permafrost, it's breaking it up. And in some, some storms, we lose up to 18 meters of land. And Tuktoyaktek will probably have to be relocated in the next 50 years which is a really difficult thing to do because people are so tied to this community that no one wants to move. And no one wants to be told that they have to move. Uh, people were told many years ago in a clavic that they were going to fall in the sea and they haven't yet. And so they point to the fact that, you know, you told us 20 years ago we're going to disappear. So there's this distrust and there's this, this inherent dislike of being told what to do. And I think that, you know, we want to control of our own destinies. The other thing that's going to happen when the sea ice disappears is that we're going to see a lot of resource development in the north. We're seeing it off the coast of Alaska where uh, Dutch Shell paid $2.1 billion, uh, I think a year and a half ago, for just the right to explore off the coast of Alaska. Exxon here in Canada spent a record $1.5 billion. That tells you something. That tells you that uh, they know that there's a lot of oil and gas there, probably 40% of the remaining uh, fossil fuels to be extracted in the world are going to be found within the Arctic Circle. Big money is likely to be made, is going to be made, and right now the oil and gas uh, industry is way ahead of public policy. They're moving in there very quickly and we're basically just experimenting to see, okay, what if, what if they find something? And we have really no plan as to what happens if they do? Um, we're going to see a lot more mining, and we're also going to see a lot more shipping, because if they do, these mines turn out to be productive, and these oil and gas operations produce a lot of oil, they're going to have to find a way of getting it out. Pipeline is one, one way, but ships are also the other way. And of course, as probably everyone knows, no one claims our sovereignty over the Northwest Passage, but virtually the entire world believes that it's an international waterway, and they are free to, to use it to transport um, goods to and from Asia to Europe or from Alaska to the eastern seaboard of the United States. And they can save up to 6,000, 8,000 kilometers doing it, which represents a lot of money. Um, the question arises, okay, so we have, we know that there's a lot more traffic going on. I think last year there was 81 ships that either did a full or partial transit of the Northwest Passage. Ten years ago, it would have been maybe a Coast Guard ship and one or two tour ships. 
uh, things are starting to move very rapidly. And what does this mean if you have a lot more shipping? Well, take this for an example. This is the Cunningham Inlet. It's an estuary at the north end of Somerset Island. It's in the Northwest Passage. And I don't think you can see it there, but there are, there are all these little white things uh, uh, in that estuary. And I can leave it up to your imagination to, to figure out what they are. Um, they're beluga whales. And beluga whales, every July and early August, come by the thousands into this estuary. And no one knows exactly what it is that they're doing there. And they come to a number of other estuaries as well, in the Nelson River and Hudson, southern Hudson Bay and other areas of the Arctic. But this is one of the most spectacular. And the number of different theories, one is, is that uh, they come in there to molt. The, the gravel bottom there just allows them to rub off their own old skin and produce new skin. And uh, the other theory is, is this is where they bring their calves because it's warmer water. Uh, they conserve energy. The calves can kind of grow very quickly. One of the third things is this is just like a giant beluga cafe where everybody gathers once a year. There's a lot of communication going on. There's a lot of burping. There's a lot of whistling. You know, hey, how are you? Haven't seen you for a long time. You know, brothers and sisters get back together. That's the one I like best. I don't know how, how much science there is in it, but... <laughs> But we know that we know that there are there are uh, there's a lot of bonding that does take place uh, in uh, in this spot, and so you, you you ask the you know the question is well what do we know about these whales? And up until very recently, we didn't know very much at all. I mean, we thought that they were shallow dwelling crit crit critters that hugged the shoreline, and um, that was basically all we knew. We knew there were a lot of them, um, so. Uh, Fisheries and ocean scientists and people from the British Antarctic Survey got the idea of putting a satellite transmitter on the backs of some of these whales. And I was involved uh, in one of the earliest episodes uh, here at Cunningham Inlet. And the only way I could get on board with this was that I had to be part of the capture team. And there was only three of us. And the, 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 the idea was that w the whales would come in, they would jump into a zodiac and uh, then herd one of these whales into really shallow water. Uh, we had all dry suits on and we had, uh, we, we looked very nifty. We had a little knife strap to our, our leg and uh, my role in this case, there was there, Tony, Tony uh, uh, Martin from the British Antarctic Survey was uh, uh, going to put a uh, hoop net around the, the head of the whale uh, and Tom Smith was going to put a rope around the fluke and when they did that I was to jump on the back of the whale and uh, the idea in this case is that once you jump on the back of a whale in uh, shallow water, they go paralyzed. And they will not move, and this just makes it easier to process them. And um, I was intimidated by that. You know, I, I thought, uh, I don't know whether I really could do it, but I, I got pumped enough that I thought this is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I'm going to have to do it. So we got this whale in very close to shore. And it was taking a long time, and Tom Smith, who's a, uh, a, an explosive personality, was getting very frustrated and starting to kind of, you could see the veins popping out of the side of his neck. Uh, and uh, finally, we, we got this whale into shallow water, and then he reminded me, he said, don't forget the knife. And I, it suddenly struck me that I have this knife, but I don't know what it was for. So I said, what do you mean, don't forget the knife? And he said, for Christ's sakes, if the whale for some reason bolts and the rope gets around your leg and you get hauled out to sea, cut it. <laughs> it was not a good time to tell me this. <laughs> so I froze. We got on top of this whale and he's screaming, jump, jump. And I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. And so he's screaming at Tony, you jump! <laughs> and Tony's British, and he's more of a techno geek. You know, he does all the, all the satellite transmitter uh, stuff. And he looks at me, and he looks at Tom, and then he looks at me again, and he looks at Tom. And he says, and I apologize, Paul, but I have to, I have to be true to the incident. And he said, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Tom was beside himself by this point, <laughs> let go control of the engines, jumped out of the Zodiac on top of the whale, leaving us spinning around in circles because no, <laughs> no one is controlling, <laughs> controlling the Zodiac anymore. And 
he was right. When you're on the back of the whale, they, they simply, okay, all right, I give up, you know, all right, do what you need to do. And uh, we, uh, they put the satellite tra transmitter on the back of the whale and then they let it go. And for the next year, they watched the, this whale and other whales as they went to places they never dreamed these whales would go. They went through the Northwest Passage, they went under the ice, they went up north into McClure Strait where there's nothing but ice, and they actually intercepted a Canadian ice, ice breaker that was Canadian, had a, a team of oceanographers on board who were cutting through multi-year thick ice that was like five, ten feet thick. And they could hear these whales at that point singing, chirping away, and they couldn't figure out, they've got to breathe, where are they coming up? And so it raised this mystery is we know very little about these whales. And so what happens? You know, if these ships start passing through and they start intercepting their migrations, or God forbid, one of these ships, say a Liberian single-hull tanker uh, that f uh, raises a flag of convenience and decides it's going to save $5 million in fuel by going through our Northwest Passage with a load of crude oil and say it hits an iceberg or runs, runs aground and uh, it spills oil. How do we deal with that cleanup? We haven't had an oil spill experiment in the Arctic since 1981. Most of the people who were involved in that early oil spill experiment are all retired or gone into the private world. We have no plan. Right now, we don't know where those biological hotspots are in the Arctic. After the Exxon Valdez disaster, uh, both the United States and Canada realized that no matter how much money you throw at a situation uh, like that, it's never going to be enough because it's just too big. So what you have to do is you have to focus on those areas that are of importance economically and environmentally and culturally. So you try to save what, what, what you can and what's worth the most. And so what they did was both countries started mapping the Atlantic and the Pacific coast to figure out if there's going to be an oil spill, which areas do we save first? Where do we go first? And we were going to do it to the, in the Arctic, but then we forgot about it, we've shelved the plan, and so now if there's an oil spill in, the, in that area, we don't know what to do. I mean, we don't know where to go, we don't have, the res we don't have ports, we don't have landing strips, we don't have any place where you could we, where you could capture the oil and take it and burn it, it would be a, an environmental disaster that would make the Exxon Valdez look like an incident. And if you think about it, in the Northwest Passage, the currents are flowing out into migratory bird uh, sanctuaries, into whale sanctuaries, into Baffin Bay and David Strait, which is an international fishery, and it becomes an international incident. How do you deal with that? We really don't have a plan. And without that ice, we have polar bears, as we're seeing now, increasingly landing on shore with no place to go. Uh, they've missed the ice. Some of them are swimming long distances trying to, trying to catch up with it. Others, like this family of bears, went 500 kilometers south last spring into the community of Delaunay on the shores of Great Bear Lake and ended up having to be shot by the RCMP because they were starving and trying to eat dogs. And we saw this happening in Alaska, and we saw it happening in northern Quebec, where they, where they, some geologists saw uh, a polar bear trying to tree a porcupine. Imagine that. Um, we're frozen. Oh, my worst nightmare. Okay. Um, so we're going to have a lot. We're going to have a, 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 you know, and I don't have to remind anyone here. This is a big project by World Wildlife Fund, and you know that story. Um, uh, this was, uh, I was out with Ian Sterling, one of probably the leading polar bear scientists in the world, um, and he's seeing the changes that we've seen take place in southwest, uh, the western and south, uh, southern Hudson Bay, also now occurring in the Beaufort Sea, where the ice is starting to melt. Polar bears are getting thinner, they're not reproducing as much, we're starting to see a decline in those populations. And what happens, you know, if we have a lot more polar bears on land where there's not for, nothing for them to eat? Well, they're going to get into a lot of trouble. Um, Inuit communities now are starting to see this, and if we have a lot of oil and gas activity and mining activity in the north, they're going to see a lot more bears. And we saw this in the 1980s where what they, their response to these bears was, we just shoot them. And so scientists were trying to figure out a way of detecting and deterring polar bears before it became necessary to uh, shoot them. I was involved in one of the projects here 
on the west coast of Hudson Bay where we were in that tower and every day we'd come to the, down to the tower, we'd have to search things out really carefully because the polar bears were always hiding or behind something waiting for us to make a mistake and so we'd have to jump on the roof of the equipment shed and uh, it took a long process before uh, you actually got back down on the ground. And it was a, it was a terrific uh, uh, project for me because you can imagine what we did every morning was we would, uh, we would uh, barbecue rancid uh, walrus and seal meat to try to attract as many polar bears as possible to this site. I was absolutely, it was just, uh, just uh, I, the smell still stays with me today. <laughs> but, but the wonderful thing is that we would attract as many as 25, 30 bears at, at, within hours of, of starting this barbecue. And of course, we had the time of our lives. You'd be appalled, but you know, our, the, the idea was that we would shoot them with rubber bullets and plastic bullets and throw firecrackers at them and we would make loud noise. We would harass them in any number of ways to try to figure out how do you get this bear to go away before it gets to the point where you shoot them. So, you know, the little kid in me just thought this is so cool, you know. <laughs> and it's, it was a terrible thing, but it was necessary. And, um, and we, we, we just saw a lot of bears interacting, which was, was, was a tremendous amount of fun. Um, Okay, now here's the stupid human trick that I did. I thought, I have to, this wasn't enough to be doing all of those wonderful things. I thought, we've got to jazz up the story. And this is a journalist game uh, uh, in me, and forgive me, uh, I, I wouldn't recommend doing this. But I, I thought it would be neat coming back the following year, and if we could build a cage embedded in the permafrost, and to see what it would be like, you know, if a polar bear knows you're there and knows that you're, you're food, what would be the response and uh, because usually you know we don't get ourselves into that situation so that's me in the cage and I figured I had a National Geographic kind of article in place here uh, when I did it and what was really interesting about this was that how the bear took its time uh, to approach it looked around it bobbed up trying to figure out what was what was going on here what was that there but he wanted to check out that there wasn't any tricks that were being played on him so he moved very slowly had a look at me. Oh no, this is this is this is not going to work. I'm sorry. He walked around the cage deliberately, and what was really frightening about it, I mean just amazing about it, was that this is gravel and snow that he's walking on. And the one thing that struck me was I could not hear this animal move. It did not make a sound. It was moving. And this animal here was about 800 pounds. And it didn't make any noise. It didn't uh, it didn't growl, it didn't uh, it didn't do anything and it looked and it was very quiet and this is probably about 10 minutes into its its uh oh dear and it 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 stiffed me and then it got up on top of the cage thinking that perhaps there was a way of, of, of getting me that way. And all this very, very, very quiet. Uh, and then he realized, okay, I know what to do. I'm 800 pounds. If I start banging on these bars hard enough, I might be able to break them. And that's what he did. And I'm sorry I don't have that, this next shot because it actually <laughs> gives you a, probably the best, the best visual of the bars starting to break. And I was, of course, realizing at this point that the, uh, uh, the biologist was out there with a gun and I knew what he was thinking. Uh, do I shoot the bear to save the, save the stupid journalist that went into that cage? <laughs> and if I do, how do I explain it? And so there are a long time elapsed before anything happened and I realized <clears throat> I could be in big trouble here. And fortunately for me, the bear just went, laid down, went to sleep and then I discovered at that point that I'd been in this cage for about an hour and a half in minus 35 degree weather and I could hardly feel my, my, my feet or my hands and I thought, how long am I going to be here? But very fortunately, the bear got up and walked away and I was saved. And I can tell you the story and I can tell you I will never do it again. <laughs> um, there's not, you know, the, the, the other confounding thing about, about this story of climate change is that there are going to be as many, there, there are going to be winners, not a lot of winners. Uh, 
in, in this climate change scenario. One of them are going to be the barren ground grizzly that I was telling you about earlier. Um, when you think about it, look, you can see how small they are. They have to hibernate for seven, eight months of the year. And uh, that's a long time to be fasting. And so giving them an extra two weeks in spring and an extra two weeks in the fall is just going to allow them to put on more of the fat reserves that they need. And we're starting to see this, this happen. Uh, less time now in hibernation, more time to hunt. In this case, this is those bears that, uh, this bear that we had caught had just killed this uh, bull caribou and it had dragged it. We followed the drag marts for four kilometers where he took it up to the top of a hill site and he dug a great big hole and then he went to all of the tree branches at the edge of the tree line and stripped all of the branches, dragged them back and laid a nice little blanket of branches on top of the, uh, the caribou and then put a layer of snow on, went back to another set of branches, trees and branches, stripped them all, brought them back until he had uh, a layer of trees and snow and ice that was, was about uh, three feet thick. And of course, we uh, came in and, and interrupted him right, at the, right when he was putting the finishing touches on it. Um, it, was, it was quite a remarkable thing to see. Um, so, you know, they're going to do well, probably do well, theoretically. Um, and we know that this already, this, uh, this bear has been on Melville Island for three years now, and perhaps even longer. And if you can imagine, Melville Island is one of those high Arctic islands. It's about 500 kilometers north of the Arctic coastline. Um, this is polar bear territory. This bear has been doing well. You can see he's roly-poly, looks pretty healthy. He's somehow finding a way of making a living. And he or another bear uh, we know mated with a female polar bear and produced a hybrid uh, a couple of years ago, which unfortunately got shot by an American hunter. Um, but there are rumors spreading that there are other hybrids roaming around the Arctic uh, now. Um, the other shot would uh, supposed to be of a muskox, and I think you know there's some indication that muskox may may do okay. And Finally, what we're going to also see is that we're going to see a lot of sp species at the north end of their range moving north into the Arctic. So we're seeing red fox now moving into Arctic fox territory. We're seeing deer going along those uh, pipeline and uh, uh, cut lines that we're creating uh, along the way, moving along those paths into the Arctic. Uh, as far north as Norman Wells, we've seen them in the northern Yukon, and we're also now seeing elk. And we're seeing predators, cougars, moving into the Arctic. Uh, Andy Williams from, from the Kalawani Research st Station saw one on, in the St. Elias ice fields, uh, that, I, that slide that I showed you earlier on. Many have been found around Wood Buffalo National Park. They're starting to follow. Um, and in a way, it's kind of neat, but it's also frightening because, I mean, you think about it, a lot of these animals are carriers of disease. And they've adapted to those diseases, and they don't have, they don't suffer from those symptoms. Uh, they start moving into territory uh, where those Arctic animals don't have any immunity to them. Uh, we could have a, a catastrophe analogous to when the Europeans came over and infected a lot of indigenous peoples with smallpox and the flu. Um, and we know that a number of animals uh, have no immunity to a lot of these diseases, and particularly narwhal and beluga. Uh, have no immunity to focine distemper. And so if you have a harbor seal or a uh, pilot whale move, you know, riding a current of warm water moving north and they come in contact with, uh, with a pod that's at the southern end, end of their range, theoretically they could make contact, infect these animals and you could have massive die-offs. We have no plan for that. I mean, we've, we have one veteran, one, one scientist uh, microbiologist working for fisheries and oceans that's looking at this and, 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 and is very concerned. Uh, the other thing that's happening is uh, with the earlier springs and the late fall rains, um, you know, it used to be thought that uh, peregrine falcons and some species would do well by this warm weather, but in the case of peregrine falcons, when you think about it, there's a chick sitting on the cliff edge. Uh, they don't have a nest. They, don't, they really toughen up their young. And uh, those rains are drenching their downy coats, and we've had uh, 95 to 100 percent die-offs of peregrine falcon chicks in various parts of the Arctic uh, because of uh, spring rainstorms that never used to come. 
Um, Piri caribou, as we know, 91% of that population has disappeared since 1961. Climate change is certainly a factor because you're getting a lot of thick ice now forming with the freezing and thawing episodes and with the rain, it creates a kind of giant ice rink on top of the land and these, these animals cannot crater through to get at the food and we've had a number of massive die-off episodes. We see the tree line moving north, uh, starting to take over uh, alpine country, which is extremely important to alpine animals, uh, tundra animals like the barren ground caribou. We're also seeing dis diseases, plant diseases that are indigenous in the north, simply take off, like the mountain pine beetle that basically overtook Alberta, or BC and Alberta. Uh, we're now seeing the spruce uh, beetle from Alaska moving into the Yukon and into the Northwest Territories. And there's an estimate of 100 million trees have died as a result of that. Um, we're seeing plants also moving, in, moving north and taking over. The southern plants seem to thrive better in those conditions than the Arctic plants do. And this is all going to have an impact on those, those tundra animals, those alpine animals. And we're already starting to see the effects. And it's going to have a huge impact on the Inuit and the indigenous people who depend on those animals and depend on those landscapes. And basically right now we really don't have a plan. What we're doing is we the plan is let's let industry go in there first and then we'll figure out what to do later. And as we know from the oil sands in Alberta, it's not a good idea. We've got to figure this situation out and we've got to f we've, we need organizations like yours uh, to be at the forefront of this, to influ influence public opinion and political opinion. I mean, it's absolutely essential because this thing is unraveling very, very quickly. We're seeing an ecosystem collapse right across uh, the Arctic world. Um, and it's also going to be a sovereignty and security problem because, you know, this is a way for illegal aliens to come in, possibly for terrorists. Uh, any number of things, you know, the military set up scenarios where, you know, the Liberian tankers come in, uh, land on a shore, run a, run a pump, and then fill up the, 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 ship, the hall, ship's hull with fresh water, which at one time was more valuable than oil. And so, what do we do? I mean, if we've got to figure it out. And I think I'm just going to leave you with these unrelated slides. I thought these, this, this would just be a fun way of ending my, my, my talk here. Um, is this is on Victoria Island, and it's the, uh, the Nanook River. And uh, along the way, we saw these mountains in the distance. And it really puzzled us, because on the maps, uh, we didn't see any mountains. It was really a pretty flat landscape here. And uh, so it was a beautiful night. We decided we would go out and hike towards them. And uh, along the way, uh, this is, we've, we've tried to figure out how far away are they and how big they are they. And I can tell you here, this is eight kilometers away. So does anybody want to venture a guess as to how high those are? I'll give you a hint by going to the next slide. This is about halfway. Wild guess? Thousand feet? Okay, anybody else? 300 meters, about 1,000 feet. Okay, this is about uh, a kilometer away. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> this is half a kilometer away. This is there. <laughs> I'll leave you with this uh, only because it, it's an example of, you know, I, I, what the message that I want to drive home is, is, is the one that I alluded to earlier. You know, the Greeks thought they had figured it out. The Northwest Passage explorers thought they had the Arctic figured out. Scientists thought they had it uh, figured out until Paul Tudge came along and found the tree trunks. And we think, you know, to some extent that we have it figured out. But the Arctic really is a fascinating place and I think is a land of great mystery and there are many things to be learned about it. And the one thing is, is that it is a very difficult place to figure out. And I think that's one of the great challenges uh, that your organization faces uh, in the future. Thank you for, for inviting me.